May has been a Dorothy Sayers kind of month. I've been meaning to reread these for a while. So I started in on Strong Poison and I enjoyed it so much. I read through it so fast that I immediately went on to have his carcass. And now I'm actually about halfway through Gaudy Night. And then I still have Busman's Honeymoon, which is delightful. And this is a brand new addition to my bookshelves. I actually had an old um, copy of the Lord Peter short stories. I found it at a used bookstore and it was really the first thing they got me into Dorothy Sayers um, but um, even when I bought it it was kind of falling apart and as I read it it fell apart even more so I thought I might as well just get the one that matches um, matches these are which ones are these Bourbon Street Books Harper Collins yeah so Strong Poison is the first in the series and this is Lord Peter and Harriet Vane so they are in four books together and actually I think there are two short stories towards the end that Harriet Vane is in as well but strong poison, Harriet Vane has been convicted of murder. Lord Peter is kind of like a birdie wooster from P.G. Woodhouse. Like he's he's a bachelor, he solves crimes. He even has like a Jeeves bunter, his manservant is pretty great. Um, but when he sees Harriet Vane, he knows it's her, but she's about to be convicted of murder and he knows that she's innocent. So he has to go about proving it. I love Lord Peter's mother, the Dowager Duchess. Whenever we get to see her, she is so funny. I wish I had known that girl. So interesting and a really remarkable face, though perhaps not strictly good looking and all the more interesting for that because good looking people are so often cows. <laughs> I've been reading one of her books. Harriet Vane is is herself a, um, a uh, mystery writer, uh, like Dorothy Sayers. I have been reading one of her books, really quite good and so well written, and I didn't guess the murder till page 200. Rather clever, because I usually do it by about page 15. Have His Carcass is a little bit slower going. This is set at a seaside town, and Harriet Vane discovers a body on the beach, and only one pair of footprints, the victim's own pair of footprints. There, there's no other. So it's very mysterious. How who how did he get there? How did this happen? My favorite chapter in Have His Carcass was they go to London. Oh, where is it? They found a photograph on the dead body and they're trying to figure out where the photograph came from and they realize it came from a theatrical agent. There are so many um, classical allusions in uh, Dorothy Sayers. Like you can tell she knew her Shakespeare with a theatrical agent get sidetracked into how difficult it is to cast Richard III. Inconsistent to my mind. You mightn't think it, but I do a bit of reading and thinking now and again. And what I say is I don't believe William Shakespeare had his mind on the job when he wrote that part. Too slimy at the beginning and too tough at the end. It ain't nature. Not but what the play it. always acts well. Plenty of pep in it. That's why it keeps moving. But he made Richard two men in one. That's what I complain of. One of them's a wormy, plotting sort of fellow. And the other's a bold, bustling sort of chap who chops people's heads off and flies into temper. It does seem to fit somehow, eh? <laughs> We believe in you, Miss Cone, said Whimsy solemnly, as devoutly as in the second law of thermodynamics. 
What are you getting at? asked Mr. Simon suspiciously. The second law of thermodynamics, explained Bimsy helpfully, which holds the universe in its path, and without which time would run backwards like a cinema film wound the wrong way. And then look at this. Dorothy Sayers must have just been having a fun time. Like, she goes off. The second law of thermodynamics will hold while memory holds her seat in this distracted globe by which Hamlet meant his head, but which I, with a wider intellectual range, applied to the planet, which we have the rapture of inhabiting. <laughs> Inspector Umpelty look, appears shocked, but I assure you that I know no more impressive way of affirming my entire belief in your absolute integrity. <laughs> You may not believe me, added Whimsy, now merrily launched on a flight of fantasy, but I have got to the point now at which the slightest glimmer of common sense imported into this preposterous case will not merely disconcert me, but cut me to the heart. Every piece of evidence that comes up in this case seems to point to an impossible dead end, but of course, Lord Peter and Harriet Bain eventually get there. Gaudy night is set in Oxford and is just, ah, oh, such a sheer delight. I only just started it, but I've already been reading it so fast. I need to go back and underline some passages. The azaleas in Animal Crossing are in bloom, and here are the real life azaleas in bloom. So I just finished A Spinner in the Sun by Myrtle Reed. This pretty book I found at um, an antique store and it was just such a lovely outside that I had to buy it. It was actually the same antique store that I found this book, La Belle Constantine, and also this book, White Orchids, by Grace Livingston Hill. And I really enjoyed both of these. These two were in the same box. This was on a shelf a little ways away. But honestly, they all feel like they could have been from the same library. And now I kind of wish I had bought more books from that box because I feel like maybe they belonged to a kindred spirit. I mentioned um, Abbe Constantin in last month's reading vlog. It is like a delicious chocolate cake, a, a delicious chocolate gâteau of a book. It uh, takes you to Paris and provincial France. Grace Livingston Hill read this um, earlier this spring and I really like her. Her romances, they're kind of set in the 30s and her heroines always feel like the odd man out, you know, like they're a little old-fashioned. Her, her novels are so sweet. And Merle Reed was brand new to me. So A Spinner in the Sun is about, about a woman named Evelina and she has had some very bad luck in love and she She's returning to the home where she grew up in the town where she she uh, fell in love after a long, long time. I don't want to give too much away. Basically, she's been like a spinner in the shadows. And um, throughout the book, we see her slowly, slowly uh, taking a journey to become a spinner in the sun. There are some really beautiful passages and beautiful... Um, Beautiful metaphors, like kind of like sort of philosophical ramblings um, interspersed in the story, and the characters are really fun. Hold on, I'm gonna try to find a couple examples. I meant to mark the passages. Sometimes, like, you're enjoying a book so much that you don't stop and grab a pen and mark a passage, and then you regret it. One step at a time, laddie, one step at a time. That's all we have to take, fortunately. When we can't see ahead, it's because we can't look around a corner. Miss Mehitable, Miss Hitty, is another one of the main characters, and she is kind of hilarious. She's one of those characters who it's delightful to read about because they're so funny, but if you had to deal with them in real life, it would not be fun. <laughs> Miss Hitty has been raising her niece, Araminta. Oh, here, this, one, this was such a funny, uh, funny passage where we got to know Miss Hitty. So the preacher is boarding at her house and 
he is asking about Evelina, who is the new newcomer in town. Miss Hitty remembers um, Evelina and is really kind to her when she arrives, helps her clean her house. But here's the preacher. Hitherto he had found his hostess, Miss Hitty, of invaluable assistance in his parish work. It had been necessary to mention only the name of, of a parishioner, as upon the turning of a faucet, a stream of information gushed forth from the fountain of her knowledge, age, date, and place of birth, ancestry on both both sides, three generations back, with complete and illuminating biographical details of ancestry and individual, education, financial standing, manner of living, illnesses in the family, including dates and durations of said illnesses. <laughs> goes on and on and on. List of misfortunes, festivities, entertainments, church affiliation, past and present, political leanings. <laughs> Tagged to it like the postscript of a woman's letter was Miss Hitty's own concise, permanent, neatly labeled opinion of the family or individual. The letter thrown in without extra charge. <laughs> But yes, yeah, she's very loyal to Evelina, so she doesn't um, kind of turn on the faucet and give him the her full history. Look at that, Minty is um, her nickname for Araminta, which I think is really, which is just really pretty. What a pretty old-fashioned name. Oh, here's another passage. This was one of the sort of philosophical digressions. I was thinking of the supreme isolation of the human soul. You and I sit here, talking or not, as the mood strikes us. And yet, what does speech matter? You know no more of me than I choose to give you, nor I of you. We are like a vast plain of mountain peaks peaks. Some of us have our heads in the clouds, though always, up among the eternal snows. Thunders boom about us, lightning rives us, storm and sleet beat upon us. There is a rumbling on some distant peak, and we know that it rains there too. That is all we ever know. We are not quite sure when our neighbors are happy or when they are troubled, when there is sun and when there is storm. The secret forces in the interior of the mountain work on unceasingly. The distance hides it all. We never get near enough to another peak to see the scars upon its surface, to know of the dead timber and the dried streams, the marks of avalanches and glacial drift, the precipices and pitfalls, the barren wastes. In blue shimmering distance, the peaks are veiled and all seem fair but our own. I really liked the metaphor in this chapter called the March of the Days. It's very strange, I'm thinking. The little laughing, creeping days go by us. Then the awkward ones that bring us the first footsteps, then childhood comes, and youth, and then maturity. But the days have begun to grow feeble before one learns how to meet them, how to take the gifts humbly, scorning none, and how to make each day give up its secret balm. Memory, the angel who stands at the portal of yesterday, has always an inscrutable smile. She keeps for us so many things that we would be glad to spare, and pushes headlong into yesterday so much that we fain would keep. I do not yet know all the ways of memory, I only know that she means to be kind. Whatever a day may bring you, whatever terrible gifts of woe, if you search her closely, you will always find the strength to meet her face to face. Overshad overshadowed by her burden of bitterness, one fails to find the balm. Concealed within her garments or held loosely in her hand, she always has her bit of consolation. Rosemary in the midst of her rue, belief with the doubt, life with the death. Yeah, there was just such a beautiful kind of reflection on the balance of, of sorrow and joy and shadow and, and light. Forgiveness, redemption. Yes, I hugely enjoyed this, Spinner in the Sun. I recently started a new ebook which I actually found for free under Playbooks. It's called 
The Cloud Dream of the Nine, a Korean novel. I mentioned this in my 20 books I want to read in the 2020s. Um, I'm not reading it in Korean. My Korean has not progressed anywhere near that far, but I'm really excited to check this out. I only just started it. This is apparently a Digital Library of Korean Classics project undertaken by Literature Translation Institute of Korea. So very excited to have a copy of this and to dive in more.